the main battery systems. Well, the big problem here is the provision of extra circuits. So what are these circuits? Well, there's the electric fan, the fuel lift pump, the air horns, for example, and they can't be powered by the existing horn circuit. I need these horns for some of the countries I go to. There's the alternator controller, the split charge controller. I got loads of new instruments, most of which need their own power, albeit low power demand, and the list soon builds up. Now the way to address this is to make a wiring hub and to pull everything together and to rationalise them. And if I plan it carefully I should also be able to build in a few extra circuits for future proofing. Now I'm well aware that there are some excellent videos out there done by people who know far more than I do about how to make a wiring hub and I'm not going to try to repeat what they've done. However there are a few aspects which seem to be missed by the others which I will highlight here. And finally, I want to make this up using existing materials which I've got in my workshop here in the various electrical boxes. Some of it new, some of it used. And I'm not in particular trying to save money, that isn't the issue. It's just that I'm one of these strange individuals who believes that in the West we use and waste far too much and I'm a great believer in recycling and reuse. Now the quality and functionality of the hub isn't going to be affected, however it could probably be a bit smarter if I use brand new materials everywhere. Drawing. Now you are going to need a drawing, even if only to have an as-built sketch so you document what it is you've done. Now I've looked at a lot of videos, what most guys do is they go out to the workshop, they wire up the hub and then they do an as-built sketch at the end of the day. But I'm sorry, that's the wrong way round. You need the drawing first before you do any work. However, I would say that, wouldn't I? I am an engineer. Now, I spent a lot of time in this phase, and I did a combined layout and single-line diagram. So what benefits did I get from it? Well, firstly, I was able to rationalise the circuits. I was able to combine circuits, eliminate duplication, decide which items could go onto the same fuse, I was also able to sort out the logic, and not all of my circuits are straight input output. Some have a bit of relay logic attached to them, and I wouldn't have been able to sort that out once I'd started the work. I was also able to optimise the layout. Now, when it came to actually doing the work, it was incredibly helpful to have a drawing to work from, and it can be very confusing. Underneath the relay holders, there's something between 30 and 40 different cables coming out, and each one obviously has to go to the correct destination and gets very confusing and I simply would not have been able to do it without a drawing. I'm pleased to say I did the wiring up without a single mistake and everything worked right first time. Now let's look at the thinking which went into the layout of the wiring centre. Now when starting out with a clean sheet of paper, it's important to bear in mind a couple of basic categorizations for the different types of circuits. So firstly, you've got the circuits which are permanently live compared to those which are ignition switched. And secondly, those circuits which only require a fuse compared to those which require a fuse plus a relay. And the main elements are as follows. We've got all of the fuses here. This is a 10-way fuse box, we're only using 7, so we've got 3 spare. In the middle we've got all of the relays. We've got space for 8 relays, of which we're only using 5, with 3 spares. And we've got the terminal blocks around the outside of the baseboard. Now we group together the circuits according to their function. So for example, here we've got all of the signal circuits going through this little terminal block. We've got all of the permanently live standard outputs here, and these are good for 10, maybe 15 amps. We've got a couple of permanently live higher powered outputs here, and we've got all of the ignition switched outputs down in this terminal block at the bottom left. So let's follow a couple of the circuits and see how they operate. The main power input is here. It's the only power input on the board, and it comes straight from the post of the starter motor. Up at the top left, we've got three circuits which are fused only, and so the output goes straight to the terminal block here. They're all permanently live. And the first of the relay circuits is up here, and this controls what I call the ignition bus. 
Now the standard Land Rover ignition circuit is very underpowered. I was only ever getting about 11 volts at the fuel cutoff solenoid and so what I did was I took that cable and I used it as the signal for the ignition circuit goes up to the relay and the output then goes down to this ignition bus and I've grouped together all of the ignition circuits. They're all fairly low powered and can sit quite happily together. We'll look at just two more circuits. Here we have the example of a permanently live higher output circuit and this is for the engine cooling fan. The power supply comes through 25 amp fuse. I have actually put in a 40 amp relay although in practice we're never going to draw more than half of that. And we've got the signal coming from the uh, fan thermo switch and the output goes down to the higher powered outputs down here. Very straightforward. A little bit more complicated is the case of the fuel lift pump. Now we actually need two relays to control this and we've got a common power input here coming through 10 amp fuse split two ways. The first relay is controlled by the ignition circuit and the second relay is controlled by the switch for the Wabasto engine block heater. Now you can't come together these two inputs because if you did it would mean that if you turned on the Wabasto it would immediately liven up all of the ignition circuits, you get a back feed and it would be very popular with a car thief who could liven up the vehicle and drive it away merely by turning on the Wabasto. So you have to keep them separate. The baseboard. You need to have a good baseboard as the foundation for a wiring centre. In my case, particularly important because I need to create the extra real estate to be able to pull all of the components together. Now ABS plastic seems to be a popular choice and very suitable too. However, I'm going to need quite a bit of it because I've got a total of five different wiring centres to make up and it can be quite expensive. You can easily spend over £50 on this. However, there is plenty of spare discarded ABS plastic around the place if you care to go out and look for it. And far better to repurpose it than to send it to landfill. I've got a nice large piece here. Didn't even have to pay too much for it either. Relay holders. If you can buy pre-wired relay holders, you're going to do yourself a favour. You'll save yourself a lot of time and a lot of frustration too. However, I just didn't have the space. I had to use vertical relay holders. But these come to price. You have to wire them yourself and they use these uninsulated latching terminals. Now I find these really fiddly. I know I'm a bit clumsy. But even using all of the right crimping tools, these with interchangeable jaws, uh, these two, I found they took me a long time to crimp and I very often wasn't satisfied with the result so I'd end up soldering them too. Now with vertical relay holders when the cables come out the bottom they've got to turn through 90 degrees and you've actually got very little space underneath and I would strongly advocate use the minimum size cable you can to handle the current. Don't oversize your cables otherwise you're just not going to have enough room underneath. Now if you're using uninsulated terminals with thin cables they've got no mechanical strength and you have to push them in up underneath the relay holder in order to get them to latch and quite often it takes a bit of uh, force to do that and they will buckle out the way. Now I'd always advocate using heat shrink behind terminals in any case but it's doubly important in this case it gives you a bit more strength and it'll make it easier to get the terminals to latch. Terminal blocks. Now looking around on the internet everyone seems to be using this type of block on auto wiring projects and they look quite good don't they? As far as I can see they work very well providing you buy good quality branded items that don't fall apart. But what about the old traditional screw type terminal? Now these work absolutely fine too, providing they are used correctly. Now the weakness which they have is that when used with stranded cable, it's often difficult to get a good electrical connection. And I have one such example here from way back. 
we had a poor electrical connection, things started to heat up under high current and the blocks started to melt. Very bad. The answer is that they must of course always be used with copper ferrules which go over the end of the cable and if you do that you should get a good quality connection with no problem whatsoever. I've got loads of these knocking around here and I decided to reuse them on this project. If you go to any industrial control room, you will find that they use thousands of these screw type terminals, obviously with ferrules. And if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. I've just done the first fitting of the wiring centre, but the thing that which you immediately notice is how untidy the fuel filter is and all the diesel lines. And the problem here is that the fuel filter is horizontal entry, whereas the rest of the diesel system is down below, and hence you've got these very awkward U-bends. The obvious solution is to convert it into vertical entry, easily done with these little guys. And I'd suggest that this is a very worthwhile mod for any Defender owner. So here's the finished product, working left to right. We've got the fuel filter here with the new vertical entry system. We have the ballast resistor to the glow plugs, originally mounted in the centre here, had to relocate it and I've surrounded it with a heat shield. And here we have the wiring centre, which is exactly as per the drawing. So we've got the fuse box, the two relay boxes and the terminals around the outside. And over here, everything is fully labelled up. I'm not very satisfied with these little labels, which are a bit untidy. And then, of course, we have the original Land Rover outfitting. Here there's a whole bunch of their cabling. And I have to say, in my opinion, my cabling is rather better. We have the servo line, we have the control cable to the heater, we have the breather tubes. And a lot of this is a bit untidy, but I don't see an easy way to neaten it up. So what's my assessment of this? Regarding the wiring centre, I'm pretty satisfied. It's the first one I've done, it's not perfect. If I did another, I'll be able to make it a little bit neater, a little bit smaller. But I know it's well designed, it's been competently wired up, it's going to be reliable, and it's fully documented, so I'm not going to have problems in the future. But the biggest improvement is the overall tidiness of the engine bay. Not just the wiring, nor the diesel lines, nor the fuel filter, but many other detailed improvements which I haven't bothered to document here.